Hey guys, my name is Jose, aka Joe Engineer, and today we're going to talk about Porsche 911 CIS airboxes. Thank you once again for joining me on another weird CIS video. Um, today we're going to talk all about the Porsche 911 CIS airbox, in particular the one on the normally aspirated cars not the, the turbo ones. Um, what the big deal is with these air boxes, why they blow up, why they have such a bad reputation, um, and uh, some of the uh, strange uh, solutions that the aftermarket has come up with in order to uh, um, address the um, the issues or shortcomings of of the uh, of the factory airbox. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this is this is purely a um, think of this as just a history lesson of of the um, the CIS airbox. I'm not trying to convince you to go with an aftermarket version of of any kind. Um, I'm just kind of presenting the information uh, information that I've learned about. Um, all the strange versions of, of CIS airboxes and um, and you know just just for kind of entertainment and educational purposes. So um, hopefully uh, you gain a little bit of knowledge here on um, on these types of uh, 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 CIS components. So the OE plastic airbox uh, was used throughout the entire range of uh, CIS powered 911 cars and. Um, it is a sturdy plastic airbox, very lightweight. Um, only weighs about maybe three and a half pounds or 1.6 kilograms. Uh, it's, it looks like it's made out of some kind of um, injection molded heat and impact resistant plastic, maybe a nylon, not 100% sure. But uh, they are sturdy and they get the job done. They are composed of two two pieces an upper half and they are screwed together to a lower half um, with some screws holding them together here all the way around the the upper half holds a whole bunch of heavy uh, hardware and the lower half uh, connects to the intake owners three on this side three on the other side and uh, there are some vacuum connections and uh, the cold start valve back here. Um, if you need a quick refresher on how CIS works, uh, this is a fairly complete system. Um, in general, this is how they work. You have the airbox has a big rectangular air filter that sits up here, and then you have the cover that looks kind of like a snorkel right above this. So. The engine inhales air through the filter into the bottom, and uh, the air goes through the airflow meter right here. And as the air goes into the airflow meter, it raises this flapper valve, which is connected to a lever. And the lever goes to the uh, fuel distributor. And basically, as the engine inhales, the more air the engine inhales, uh, the more um, the more fuel that the distributor fuel distributor will send to the individual injector lines, which look injectors look like this. And <clears throat> there is supposed to be a boot here that connects the airflow meter to the throttle body, and obviously air goes in raises the flapper valve, goes through the boot into the, into the throttle body. Throttle body goes into the, uh, empties into the chamber below and air um, will mix with some fuel in here during cold start uh, situations because you have a cold start valve back here that which sprays directly into this lower chamber 
This cold start valve is kind of sort of like a fuel injector, um, but it only operates during during cold starting uh, situations, and it adds extra fuel into the uh, into the air to richen up the mixture and allow the engine to warm up uh, as quickly as possible. The Additionally, on the bottom uh, chamber here, you also have um, a few connections. You've got this connection usually goes to a, a bung that connects to the vacuum source for the brake booster. And on the other side, you have a, this usually connects to the EGR on the early cars. Here's a EGR valve, goes in there. The later cars just had this blocked off, had a, um, a plug here. Also on, on here you have this connection here, usually it's just a through hole. This usually goes to the uh, fuel vapor canister. So fuel vapors will get sucked in through the canister and whatever isn't um, absorbed by the canister will get sucked in and go into the intake tract so they don't get released into the air. This hole over here, I don't know what is connected um, on this side. On mine, um, on my 83 SC, this is plugged. But um, yeah, here's another port here that they all have in common. And that is, that is pretty much, whoa. That is pretty much it. Everything else is just kind of a mounting, mounting tabs and and bosses for uh to mount this to the top of the of the engine block but most of the air boxes actually i think all the air boxes have the same connections except depending on the year some connections are open and some are blocked off the air boxes were pretty much the same exterior dimensions throughout the entire model year range however over the model years, the diameters of the intake ports going into the runners uh, changed. Um, in 1973 and a half, they were um, the smallest at 30 millimeters. And I like the way a professional, a friend who is a professional Porsche mechanic puts it in that uh, he says that it's almost like the 73 and a half was a uh, CIS setup was a proof of concept to see if the system works uh, because literally immediately in half a model a year later in 1974 they increased the port size from 30 millimeters to 34 millimeters and they ran the 34 millimeter port from 1974 to 1977 then the early U.S. market SCs from 78 to 79, and also the entire range of Euro SCs from 78 to 83. Got an even bigger um, um, ID uh, on the runners of 38 millimeters. And then the emissions compliant Lambda uh, SCs from 1981 to 1983, like mine, um, uh, went back to the 34 millimeter uh, runner. And one quick tip here is that a lot of people who want to improve the performance of their CIS equipped cars will swap out their air boxes and their intake runners for the ones with the, um, the, the largest uh, diameter because uh, these cars need all the help they can get um, in terms of improving airflow into the combustion chambers. Because they take such a convoluted, uh, the air goes through such a convoluted path into the engine, you know, air has to go in and it goes up, across, down, into the lower chamber, and then into each runner. So the air is doing this weird path and, and although it's not, it's definitely not as efficient as, you know, ITBs or or uh, some of the, the Porsche Motorsport type of um, mechanical fuel injection or the earlier Weber 
uh, carbs that had the individual throats that just went straight down into the um, intake chamber. Um, uh, so it's not as efficient as any of those systems, obviously in, in terms of performance, but apparently it was um, quite efficient in terms of improving fuel economy and, and reducing um, uh, emissions. So what are the Achilles heels of, what is the Achilles heel of this system? Well, one of the major uh, Achilles heels of, of the, the CIS, the 911 um, uh, CIS system is uh, essentially vacuum leaks. What I envision happening is that the exposure to engine oil through overfilling for oil leaks causes the rubber on all of the vacuum connections to eventually break down. And also heat and old age causes the, the rubber to, to break down as well. So eventually you have rubber components that are vacuum components and those eventually both result in, uh, in vacuum leaks. Once a vacuum leak is present in the system, now your fuel mixture is off. You've got more air um, into the system than is supposed to be there. Um, and what probably a lot of people did is they came in and with their little adjustment wrench and simply readjusted the fuel mixture back to where the car was running right instead of fixing the vacuum leak. So if a vacuum leak was present, caused a lean condition, then the car didn't run right. Rather than fixing the root cause, they would come in and probably readjust the fuel uh, mixture and off they went. So now the vacuum leak is still present in the system. And as the car got older and older and the rubber pieces broke down even more, then more vacuum leaks were present in the system. So as there were more and more vacuum leaks, they would probably just come in and readjust the fuel mixture over and over and over rather than fixing the root cause of, you know, repairing the defective rubber components that were causing the vacuum leaks in the first place. So eventually there has to be a, a breaking point and if the vacuum leaks are bad enough and the mixture is off significantly, then backfiring can occur uh, inside the box. So backfiring can happen at any time during the while the engine is running, but it is especially more common during cold starting when you have excessive fuel va vapors that are collecting in the in the lower chamber of the air box because the cold start valve is spraying into the into the bottom here so um, during cold starting uh, situations if you have fuel vapors in here you, you get a backfire essentially a little explosion here in this lower chamber which is sealed off because you've got if there's an explosion air can only go down into the the combustion chambers or back up through the throttle, throttle body and if the throttle is closed and the intake valves are closed and there's an explosion in here then the pressure has nowhere to go um, so what ends what ends up happening is that the the seal will break between the top half and the bottom half of the air box and here's a perfect example of, of that happening this is my air box my old air box from my car when I bought it. And my air box was destroyed by a backfire maybe 500 miles after purchasing the car and driving it. And actually it happened. I bought the car in late spring, drove it all summer, had a great time. And then once it started to cool down and the density of the air was different, uh, it, it popped once during a, a, a cold start uh um, one saturday morning so airbox went kaboom and as you can see 
there is a, so this is bolted, this is bolted into here, like that. And there is a, what you call a tongue and groove uh, joint holding the, or sealing the two halves together. You've got a groove, a groove on the lower chamber and a, a lip on the upper chamber. And the lip seals into here, uh, creating the tongue and groove joint. Uh, I don't recall if there was any glue in here. Uh, maybe just the joint itself uh, seals. Uh, but in any case, what ended up happening is airbox went kaboom. And as you can see, the lip on mine broke right about here. So there's a big chunk of the lip that is gone from here and is actually stuck in here. So I had a huge vacuum leak kind of in, in that, in this corner right in here. And the vacuum leak was big enough that this vacuum leak in conjunction with the other vacuum leaks that were already in my system from old rubber hoses and, and things like that created a condition where there was way too much air being inhaled into the engine that combustion was not even possible. So uh, yeah, it uh, exploded, wouldn't run anymore. And so began my, my years long descent into um, uh, CIS uh, troubleshooting and uh, uh, you know learning how all this uh, stuff works. So what did the factory do to to try to mitigate this um, this problem once they became aware of it? So as as I mentioned earlier, the um, the cold star valve sprays fuel into this lower chamber. The vapors collect in here and and um, eventually cause a, a, a backfire, even though they're supposed to be going into, they're supposed to be sucked up by the um, intake runners and down into the combustion uh, chamber of each, of each cylinder. So one of the things that the factory did to try to prevent this from happening uh, or reduce the chances of this happening was that they installed a Rather than the cold star valve just spraying directly into this open chamber here, they installed a, a manifold. It call, uh, some of the guys on the forums call it the spider, uh, but essentially it looks, it's this kind of six-legged insect looking thing that uh, is a steel manifold that the cold star valve sprays into. And then it's got little tubes and each tube goes into every individual runner so that the fuel vapors don't collect in here but rather they go straight they get carried straight to the um entrance of every intake runner and then they'll get sucked down into into every um uh, combustion chamber and actually and i believe that this was implemented in cars from 1980 onward from the factory and now by now a lot of the older cars that have had their cis repaired and their air boxes uh, repaired. When you go back and buy a new air box from Porsche, it has the manifold already um, installed. And you can see in this old air box, I think this is a 1974 setup, um, but this one already has the, the, the manifold in it. And you can see the tips just kind of hanging out in here. So this manifold um, for the cold start valve um, did improve cold start performance and it did reduce um, the incidence of backfires, but it did not eliminate them completely. Uh, I can tell you, for example, my, uh, my own car had the manifold installed and mine still backfired anyway, but that's not really the that was more uh, caused by all the numerous vacuum leaks that were in, in, um, in my car because it was neglected and didn't have um, uh, proper maintenance done on it. So that was the factory's um, solution for this, but um, the aftermarket also responded with their own um, uh, solutions. And well before 
the uh, the 1980 um, cold start manifold. So the aftermarket responded with several different uh, solutions to the um, the exploding plastic air boxes, and their the thing they have in common is that they all said, "Hey, these plastic boxes are not explosion proof, so let's make." the air box out of a material that is explosion proof, such as metal. So, uh, you know, several different companies came out with several different versions of metal air boxes um, based on what those companies uh, uh, skill set was. It's funny, the uh, their there is a cast aluminum version, there is a stainless steel welded sheet metal uh, version uh, and there are also machined aluminum versions and it's funny how each each version was uh, obviously uh, built of built based on that uh, suppliers uh, individual skill set you know the casting guys came up with the cast solution the sheet metal guys made the sheet metal solution and the machining guys obviously made the the uh, machine solution but um, and later on, there was a uh, a pressure relief valve that is a little device that goes into the OE plastic version. So let's discuss all of these aftermarket solutions in detail in what I think is the chronological order in which these um, uh, alternative uh, air boxes appeared on the market. So the first version of these aftermarket air boxes is lurking here in my own engine bay. But I wanted you to take a look at it and see what it looks like installed. Looks pretty factory, huh? Let's take off the air filter cover. Cover and the air filter, and ta-da! We have a cast aluminum air box. So I believe that this is the earliest version of the aftermarket air boxes for a few reasons. Uh, this one came with some very, very, very small. Uh, ID um, uh, IDs on the uh, intake runner connections definitely smaller than mine which are 38 millimeter and I, so I had to uh, grind out a bunch of material to get it to match the the port sizes on on my runners another reason is that the cold start valve connection did not have uh, mounting provisions for the little manifold the um, the spider um, it didn't have the the three little bolt holes that it normally uh, mounts into also uh, this this one has kind of the roughest cosmetic quality out of all the aftermarket solutions in my opinion and it just it just I mean it's just kind of a rough rough casting uh, so yeah that that's why I think it's it, it just seems older than um, the other options that were out there. I don't know who the manufacturer is. Um, if you know um, or have any history on, on these, please uh, please post it in the comments. So what are the advantages of this aluminum air box? Is, uh, well, one of them is that it bolts up exactly like the OE one. It has exactly the same connections on the outside to connect to the rest of the engine. So throttle body, Fuel distributor, airflow meter, all the vacuum stuff, everything connects exactly the same. It has very stout, thick walls everywhere. I want to say there's maybe about minimum an eighth of an inch wall thickness everywhere. And it definitely gets thicker in the corners where you have like, you know, corner radii and stuff. 
So it's it's pretty it's pretty bomb proof in terms of um, you know resisting um, backfires. Also, this one came with an integrated uh, pressure relief valve in here uh, that was also cast aluminum. I've switched mine out to a different one, but more more on this one later. But the original one was a aluminum, a cast aluminum one, and whenever there whenever there was a backfire in here, it had a spring loaded uh, valve that would open up, release pressure, um, which would then get sucked back up into the intake track and it would close back up in order to maintain vacuum. So that was that was a feature of the the aluminum box. It also had a a high temperature uh, orange silicone gasket that was integrated into the lower half of the air box um, that created a, a, very, a really good seal between the top half and the bottom half. And um, it was both top and bottom half were um, held together with, with machine screws. So the, the two pieces were sealed very well by the, the screws and the, and the gasket. Also, as I demonstrated earlier, before I took the the air filter um, and the cover off, it it looks it looks pretty OE. Um, you know, it's it's hard to tell that this is an aftermarket piece, especially because um, if you're not if you're not familiar with these systems, how would you know that it's that it's uh, not a, a factory piece? It's cast aluminum just like the, the intake runners and it more or less matches the, the same uh, exterior finish. So it, it looks, it look it doesn't look out of place. So that is kind of one advantage of, of putting an aftermarket piece in here that doesn't look, uh, it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. What are some of the disadvantages of this box? Well, it's, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> it weighs, uh, this one weighs about nine pounds or about 4.1 uh, kilograms. And this is in contrast to the, the, the original uh, plastic box, which weighs, um, you know, 3.5 pounds. So this one weighs almost three times as much as the, as the, um, the original box. Uh, another disadvantage is that there were, this casting had some porosity in it. There were some corners where there were some pores or pinholes that were in fact um, would have been vacuum leak areas and I I had to pressure test this unit find the leaks and seal them with epoxy to make sure that um, vacuum leaks through the pores wouldn't be an issue um, as I had mentioned earlier the the diameters the IDs of the runner connections were smaller than my 1983 uh, runners, so I had to grind out a bunch of material with um with a die grinder uh, to get it to match my my runners. Um, as I had mentioned before, there was no there was no cold start uh, manifold mounting provision, so I had to I had to design and machine a little mount um, that I had welded inside of the airbox so that I could transfer the 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 spider from my plastic air box into this one. Um, another uh, disadvantage that is uh, technically also a disadvantage in the plastic air box is that these screws that hold the upper and lower halves together are technically in the intake tract. They're uh, downstream of the air filters. So if these ever came out, they could they could theoretically get swallowed down the throttle body and and you know cause some serious damage to the engine um, but uh, my countermeasure for that is was to buy uh, screws of the same thread that uh, were that had drilled heads and then I safety wired them so these will never come out and they'll never go um, into the get swallowed by the engine uh, Another disadvantage, at least on my unit, was that the pressure relief valve that was in here didn't seal very well. It actually had kind of a huge uh, vacuum leak that um, caused me a lot of a lot of uh, um, a lot of issues in, in in trying to figure out why I couldn't get my idle down 
to um, a correct uh, setting. So I ended up creating a, unbolting it, creating this adapter plate um, for a plastic pop-off valve, and now it works fine. And I'll talk more about this a little bit later um, in the video. But after sorting out all of the issues that I just mentioned, um, I'm actually very happy with, with, with the way it's been performing. It's been rock solid ever since. And, you know, very, I, I try to keep this engine tuned as, as well as possible, but it still will backfire every now and then, especially if it's cold outside. I cold start it and I take off and I kind of, you know, uh, you know, heel toe uh, and, and, and kind of, you know, blip, blip the throttle a little too early before the engine has had a chance to warm up, it'll backfire a little bit. So I'd like to think that this airbox has um, saved me um, a few times because, uh, uh, you know, I'll get a little backfire here and there and the car will shake it off and, and you know, not skip a beat. Because of the, you know, the, the, the performance, I, I, I have no regrets in installing it whatsoever. And uh, these, as I mentioned before, I don't know who the manufacturer is. Uh, so I couldn't tell you where to get one other than, you know, potentially on eBay or any, you know, Porsche classified uh, um, uh, forums for, for used parts. They do come up uh, for sale occasionally. I know on the, um, the Pelican Parts Classifieds. Um, is where I would see these once every few months, and that's where I got mine as well. So our next aftermarket solution is this gorgeous stainless steel airbox made out of welded, TIG welded stainless sheet metal. This uh, stuff's not magnetic, so I've, I think it's 300 series stainless. Um, but it's quite, quite beautiful <laughs> in terms of uh, workmanship. Um, so because of that and just kind of the general styling of it, I think it's a little bit more modern than the, than the cast one. This one is made by, was made by a shop called Web Manufacturing. This one is not labeled. But I've seen other unit pictures of of other units on the web that had a, a label that said web manufacturing. Um, so yeah, that's that's who made it. I don't know if they're still around or not. Um, the some of the advantages of this this airbox is that again, like the cast aluminum one, it bolts up exactly like the OE plastic one. You you have the same. Same connections for the airflow meter, the throttle body, air filter goes on the same way. Runners, EGR, um, the uh, cold start valve, the, the tabs to mount it to the engine, all that stuff is there. So it mounts exactly like the, the OE plastic box. Another advantage is that, man, this this stainless steel construction is, is really strong. It's almost too strong for, for the application. This thing is this thing's an absolute unit. It has, uh, this particular one has the same 38 millimeter runners. Um, it would be compatible with my car. Um, uh, it has, it also has an integrated stainless steel pressure relief valve, which is this thing here. I think this this whole plate is the the flapper valve, and then it's got this really cool high temp gasket around it. Uh, four bolts spring that are spring loaded, and uh, this really cool uh, these really cool lock uh, uh, retainers that will prevent the the bolts from spinning out. And uh, getting sucked up by the uh, by the engine, so very very cool. I don't know what kind of pressures would um, would need to lift this thing, but it would have to be quite a bit because man, this thing's pretty pretty freaking stout. Um, the another advantage here is that the upper and lower halves are welded together. You don't have a gasket um, of any kind. 
you can see the that the the upper and lower half are TIG welded together. So no gasket to worry about. It also has really nice integrated high temp silicone throttle body uh, gaskets and um, a pop off valve gasket. It's very, very nice here. Some of the disadvantages of this unit are that it is unbelievably heavy. This one weighs 11 pounds <laughs> or <clears throat> five kilograms. It's, 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 it's just just such a beast of a of an air box. Um, another disadvantage is that this is all sheet metal construction um, with very kind of very square sharp corners on here. Um, and with uh, repeated heat cycling and vibration, it's very likely to uh, to crack somewhere. Uh, actually, if you look, let's see if I can prop this up. If you look here. I don't know if this comes up in the camera, but I can catch my finger on a crack that is already here. This, there's a crack from about here all the way to here, from there to there. So this has to get touched up and uh, re-welded shut. But this crack, this definitely would be a, um, a vacuum uh, issue. Uh, and it would it would be very difficult to diagnose uh, unless you did like a smoke test or, or something. It wouldn't be immediately uh, obvious. Another kind of subjective disadvantage, at least to me, is that it has less of an OE appearance um, because of the shiny stainless steel construction. It just there is no other shiny stainless steel in the in the engine bay, so from this side where you could see this face um, or from the other side it would it would kind of you would it, it, it would look kind of aftermarket ish so in terms of performance assessment i actually have no idea what this would be like um, i've never i've never ran it um, some of the comments online that i've seen on the forums are um are pretty positive um in terms of you know functionality um, one thing that I um, I believe this uh, particular unit is geared for is towards very early boosted applications and the reason I say that is uh, uh, back in the day there were very early turbo kits bolt-on turbo kits for um, for the 911 SC that um, hung the turbo off the back uh, behind the engine, kind of like in the same location as the 930s, but they had the the intake charge piping would bolt would bolt directly into the throttle body. But they used the OE airbox in order to connect the charge piping. So if you can imagine what is the what are some of the potential problems with that? If this plastic airbox can barely handle a a momentary backfire, imagine how well this is going to be in a boosted application with you know running a few pounds of boost. <laughs> so I think in that scenario is where this airbox would have been uh, advantageous and probably why it exists in the first place. Also because this flapper valve, um, the uh, some of the uh, other ones that exist are very light duty and, and with very, very minimal pressure, they will open up to kind of vent pressure. But this one, this one is beefy as hell and it's very difficult to, to pick it up. So I have a feeling that this thing was designed to uh, withstand a few pounds of boost pressure. And if you had the boost pressure plus a backfire, uh, then it would uh, momentarily release pressure and, uh, and vent. Uh, so this is just a guess. I've never actually seen anyone 
um, use this in a boosted application, but that's that's kind of my my prediction. And same as the aluminum air boxes, these do these are rare, but they do come up for sale occasionally on eBay or the Porsche Forum classifieds. So, you know, I think uh, that, that's where I got this one too. Not because I was going to put it in the car, but mostly because mostly for the novelty. I wanted to kind of see one up close and and uh, you know see see what it was like. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in any of these, I guess uh, yeah, keep an eye on on uh, eBay or or the forums or or something. The last version of aftermarket airbox are machined aluminum versions. And in particular, there are some modern CNC machined versions. I've never seen any of these in person. I've only seen them, seen pictures of them in the forums, uh, both from people um, trying to sell them. The creator saying, hey, I've, we've just developed this machined airbox. If anyone is interested, hit me up to place an order, et cetera, et cetera. Or just simply historical pictures of of machined air boxes that other people had made. And essentially you can, I mean, imagine, imagine a machined version of, of, of this box that's just made of, you know, machined aluminum boxes and plates that all bolt together with, um, with machine screws. That's essentially what it looks like. Some of those are really pretty. They had, they were, um, since they were aluminum, they had anodized coatings on them, so they looked really cool, although very, very much aftermarket. I imagine that if they're designed and fabricated proper, properly, those should work just to, um, uh, should, should function just as well as, as the OE ones. Um, but I can also imagine that being a machined box with, you know, thick walls, big enough to put screws through and, and, and tap threads and all that good stuff. I would imagine that those are not going to be lightweight, lightweight at all. In fact, they'll probably be comparable to this, this, uh, uh, heavy unit right here. So the most modern and the most common backfire solution for the 911s with CIS is the humble plastic pop-off valve, which is this a little guy right here they cost about you can buy these now at any porsche parts uh, supplier uh, they cost around 30 to 40 bucks i believe the manufacturer is euro parts um, or at least i know they you can buy them from euro parts now i don't know if they were the original creator or manufacturer of these but currently you can get them from euro parts uro these little guys, they don't get any respect <laughs> because they look like a like a toilet seat, literally. And a lot of people install them wrong and they make things worse. So as you can see, this is this is just simply a pressure pressure relief valve. When the backfire happens, this vents the pressure, closes back up, and now the Airbox can hold vacuum again. To get this in your airbox, you have to drill a giant hole in the plastic airbox and glue the valve in place. So some of the advantages of this unit are that it's very cheap, 30 to 40 bucks uh, today, and they work pretty well when they are installed correctly. Um, also, the air filter goes right here, so uh, they are hidden. They, they stay out of view once the air filter is installed. Also, they're very low maintenance. Um, all you have to do is, if you open it, you can see there's an there's a O-ring on the lower lip. And all you have to do is occasionally grease that O-ring with silicone grease and uh, to improve the seal, and you're done. So, if you... If, if the grease ever dries out and you do a smoke test, you'll see a little bit of smoke seeping out through here. But once you grease that O-ring back up, it'll it'll improve the sealing and you won't have a, a vacuum leak in here, or at least not a very, very significant one. 
some of the disadvantages of these things are that when they are installed incorrectly, they cause more problems than than they solve. And like I'd mentioned before, most people or a lot of people install these incorrectly. Also, once you drill that giant hole in the air box, uh, you, you are committed. Let me show you why uh, installing these is such a challenge. So on your air box, your plastic air box, if you were going to install a pop-off valve, you would have to install it right here in this little area um, inside the, the perimeter of the screws, which is where the lower chamber is. So right in here. Now, one of the first problems is you're, you're gonna drill this hole on this area that has a bunch of fins on it. So you have to, the instructions typically say to drill a pilot hole somewhere. They give you kind of a paper template. You center punch a hole, you drill the hole, and then you get a big hole saw and uh, cut out the, the correct size hole to install the valve. Then, once you've drilled your hole, you have to do some clearancing of these fins so that the, the, the body, the, the flange that is around the body of the, the pop-off valve has a place to sit on the airbox. It needs to be a nice flat surface like this, but you've got these fins that are in the way. So you essentially have to grind them off with a Dremel to get a nice flat area to, to put them in, or at least you should. But the problem is a lot, not everyone is into, not everyone is a fabricator, not everyone is an engineer, not everyone um, is good at uh, these types of things. So there are a lot of cases where they simply smear on some glue on the outer, uh, uh, on the OD of the valve and they just, they just shove it in place. And then you have a very tiny bond line and eventually that ends up uh, not sealing very well, so you end up with a bigger vacuum leak than you had before, or a backfire happens and it just blows the valve completely out. Also, if you look under here, under the area where you will be drilling the hole, you also have more, more kind of reinforcement ribs in this, in this area. So. I mean, there's nothing you could do about this backside because it's inside the box. Um, but yeah, there's there's just there's just no there's no flat area for the glue for a bead of glue to kind of collect itself and, and seal um, around the uh, the valve. So that's how that's how people screw them up typically. And a, a good installation will have these fins notched out so that you have uh, a nice flat surface so that the flange of the valve can do some sealing against this surface as well. You want to have as big of a contact area as possible to seal um, onto the um, um, onto the airbox. So imagine this is the plastic mounting surface of a plastic air box and this is your valve you can see I've got a, a large gray bead of, of, of epoxy sealing this to its mounting surface all the way around and I sanded both surfaces and wiped them clean and, and put on some high-performance epoxy and and there and it's a very strong bond between this between the valve and the mounting surface now I have a, the unique situation that um, I mounted this in an aluminum airbox because as I mentioned before, the, the pressure relief valve that came with the aluminum airbox was not that great and was causing me vacuum leaks. So I got rid of it, but there was already a hole um, in the aluminum airbox and that hole was bigger than the, than uh, the size of this um, plastic uh, pop-off valve. So there was no way for me to attach this directly to this. So I had to make an adapter plate to bond 
this to the adapter plate and bolt the adapter plate to the aluminum air box with the gasket that I made myself to, to seal it all together. And this whole sandwich of, of stuff works fantastic. And I have the added benefit that um, uh, I picked a, a plastic that uh, has a uh, the correct coefficient of thermal expansion so that as this grows, it'll still, um, uh, um, it'll still work with the aluminum uh, and also with the plastic uh, that is that is in here. So that's my unique um, application of this. And uh, you know, after installing it, I can tell you that my overall assessment of this is that since mine is installed correctly and I did my due diligence to make sure that is that it is uh, sealed uh, uh, properly, uh, it it does the job just fine. It um, when it does uh, uh, backfire on, on rare occasions, the engine doesn't skip a beat and I keep going down the road. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, um, that's just, just my data point for, um, uh, the, for the uh, users of these uh, plastic uh, pop-off valves. So to summarize the um, rationale behind all of these uh, aftermarket air boxes. Um, we have to keep in mind that most of these aftermarket air boxes were created or aftermarket solutions were created when CIS was still very new. And there were, there seemed to be no other solutions to the backfiring uh, problem for the, the, the 911. And you have to keep in mind that the 911 is and was back then a a very high-end sports car and the owners have we 911 owners have very high expectations of of the car and and um, its capabilities so it seems almost unacceptable that a simple such a simple uh, deficiency uh, could be so debilitating to the car um, so the market responded by creating offering solutions when when uh, it seemed like there was no no other hope from from the factory itself and also you know all of these alternatives became obsolete as soon as porsche went to uh, motronic fuel injection in 1984 with uh, the 3.2 carrera this is probably why so few of these metal air boxes uh, still exist because the demand for these dried up literally in 1984 and everyone who who needed one probably already bought already had one or you know the 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 demand for these dried up very very soon afterwards because there was a new version of of uh, fuel injection so there was no need to keep creating these as because there was no new cars being produced with the defective uh, uh, CIS um, uh, design. So probably most of these ended up um, in, in, in the scrapyard and it's kind of a miracle that um, uh, some of these are still uh, in existence. And also anyone repairing uh, CIS today is, um, is more than likely going with a, a brand new OE plastic box. And maybe, maybe the the uh, the plastic pop off valve that goes in here, but that um, that is still kind of a controversial topic in the uh, in the Porsche community um, because um, you know it's very important to note that most professionals will recommend sticking with the OE airbox with no modifications because a well maintained CIS 911 should not backfire. And that is technically true. Um, in 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 my opinion, this is just my opinion. Any of the aftermarket uh, solutions available can help add a, a factor of safety in withstanding a backfire. However, um, none of them, as you had seen, as you've seen all the uh, the work that I had to do on my own aluminum airbox. Um, as you've seen in the amount of work that it takes to 
correctly mount the pop-off valve. And as you've seen in the um, defects that can be present in some of these in the stainless steel boxes, um, uh, you know, none of these solutions is 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 perfect, and you still have to do your due diligence in sorting out all the details before installing um, any of these in the car uh, and expecting it to work correctly. But then again, if you wrench on cars and you modify them, you know that this is typical of any aftermarket engine parts. Very rarely are there any aftermarket parts that you can take out of the box, slap it on the car and they work perfectly. There's always usually something that you have to tweak and fine tune in order to get it to work uh, the way it's, it's supposed to. And in, in many things, like, like many other things, but especially with CIS, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So um, one thing we can all agree on is that you need to make sure to focus your efforts on maintaining the CIS and all of its components um, uh, uh, first in order to prevent vacuum leaks and make sure that your fuel mixture is within spec. That takes care of the, the majority of, of the root cause in, in, um, in uh, 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 backfires. And as you already know, I have a ton of other videos on exactly on those topics. So make sure that you check those out before uh, resorting to any aftermarket uh, solutions to solve your problems. So that's that's about it. Thank you so much for uh, going with me on this uh, journey into the weird world of CIS uh, airboxes. Uh, if this was uh, um, educational for you or entertaining um, at all, uh, please like and subscribe, and uh, I will see you on the next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye now.